Brother John Holt, are you blowing that diet of yours, are you? No, sir, not today. Okay, all right. So I just want to take a moment and tell you what happened to the speaker that was scheduled to come. So I had asked a few months ago, Brother, uh, well, Michael Miano, to come from the Blue Point uh, Bible Church. Now, Michael is a preterist. That means he believes those things are past. That's what that word means. It's a Latin term. It just means past. We believe that Christ came to fulfill all things, and by the end of the Jewish age, everything had been fulfilled. We live in the results of fulfillment today. I had met or talked to Michael over the phone, never still have met him face to face, and he debated a futurist, and uh, he made the argument about the airplane. I thought it just made perfect sense. Never had heard that before. He said that he had traveled to a place on an airplane. He was going back in the same way, but he was going to wear a different suit. I said, that's brilliant. And I thought of underwear, too. And, uh, <laughs> well, I did. I just thought that was pretty good. Anyways, so uh, um, I think I messaged him first, or he messaged me. I don't know how that goes. And, and we ended up talking to each other. After one of his presentations, I called him. And we talked on the phone, and I said, Michael, I want to challenge you with some things. He said, I think you're a good man, honest guy. I think you're looking for the truth and looking for the Lord and establishing a relationship with him. He said, well, thank you. I'd like to believe that's exactly what I'm all about. He said, I disagree with uh, your teachings. I disagree with the concept of total depravity, unconditional election of saints, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and perseverance of the saints. And he was a five-point Calvinist. He's a five-point Calvinist five months ago. Okay? Or six months ago. Whatever it was now. He gives up total depravity. Gives up unconditional election and limited atonement and irresistible grace and perseverance of the saints. All right. Now we're cooking with peanut oil. Okay? Now, now we're doing pretty good. All right? So then we start studying about obeying the gospel. But the Spirit wasn't given to the sinner. The Spirit was given to those revealing the truth to the world. That's the way that it worked. He didn't come inside the, the, the sinner to in, enliven the truth that already was there at late in some time. And he, and he no longer believed that. We studied miracles and the imposition of the apostles' hands and the Holy Spirit given through them, which he affirmed that he thought was true. And then we studied the obedience to the gospel. Now, he believed in the necessity of baptism, and even baptism for the remission of sins, he said. His issue was, how much must you understand about baptism for the remission of sins in order for baptism to have its biblical effect? That's what I understand that his consternation was. That was Lipscomb's issue, by the way. Anybody withdraw from David Lipscomb that I know of? I don't think he got withdrawn from much, did he? The truth of the matter, when individuals are studying, these things, are they give them consternation. We think in Churches of Christ we've had this clean history. We're all just the church. Why, there's Churches of Christ in California where Cyrus Jeffries preached, right? You did some research on this? I think I did. I think I told you about that church. I did, yes. Okay. So it was a church of Christ. They didn't use instrumental music, but they had infant baptism. Now you go figure that one out. Okay? So we didn't have a clean history. Folk were studying. It took a while. And then the 40s and the 50s, we really got off balance somewhere, thinking that... <clears throat> I, I'm not going to get into the details, but we started splintering right and left over uh, uh, silly stuff. And so... As I started studying with Michael, I was impressed by the way he was open to the truth. And it occurred to me, because we believed in the coming of the Lord, how much camaraderie we had and how much open we were. If he gave me any kind of truth that I needed to move on, I certainly would. Why wouldn't I if it was the truth? 
And Michael has given me some truth on the coming of the Lord. I learned it from the Baptist. Yep. <laughs> you know, and, uh, and I was glad to learn it from him. And so I invited him to come, and, and he said this to me. He said, well, either you can dunk me or we'll have a debate. <laughs> and I said, you know, that's a pretty good deal, right? So I said, if you're not baptized, I can't let you participate on Sunday, okay? Because that's worship, and now I'm uh, bidding, uh, extending full fellowship. I said, but if I baptize you, I'll tell William Bell to sit and you preach, okay? <laughs> I'd love to have that. <clears throat> and because uh, that was the Sunday morning hour, you know, we would still let William do something. And since you already taught, it worked out good. So I could kick you off and put William on for the Bible study and if that all worked out. But Michael couldn't come. OK, Michael couldn't come. So his plane was delayed on Thursday night three or four times. And then they had tornadoes on Friday and he couldn't get here till late tonight. I guess it would be late tonight, which messes up the program. So Michael can't come. He texted me and said he would be giving his lesson on Revelation chapter 14 at the Blue Point Bible Church uh, this Sunday. So you can listen to what he has to say about Revelation chapter 14. Let me say this too. When I give assignments out on the book of Revelation, the first thing that I want to make sure you do is to know what you're talking about in the book of Revelation. That automatically excludes the entire Bellevue lectureship <laughs> because none of them know what the book of Revelation is about. <laughs> excludes all of GBN because they think in the future coming. It excludes most of the brotherhood because they're false teachers on the coming of the Lord. They believe in the third coming of the Lord. There is no third coming of the Lord. There's only a second coming, and that came within the generation that Jesus promised to come. So Michael Miano, who's given up five points of Calvinism, beginning to teach the necessity of baptism, wondering if he himself has to be rebaptized, who has clarity on the book, is a better choice for me then guys like Daniel Denham and Michael Hickson and whatever these guys named B.J. Clark, who are all over the map when it comes to the coming of the Lord. So, yes, I prefer Michael Miano to B.J. Clark. I just, I'm sorry, I just do. I do. And to all of these guys who call us false teachers and then are unwilling to meet us, William Bell challenged B.J. Clark to debate. He said he would meet him in Michigan. We will provide... The place for B.J. Clark to meet this man, William Bell, in debate. Let's see if he'll put up what he said. Let's see if he does it. <laughs> I wouldn't want to meet him. <laughs> if I were a futurist. Yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you what. You give William Bell some time on a subject matter. Well, that guy cooks with peanut oil. He's got a... Beautiful brain that works great when it comes to these matters. Now, it, doesn't, it doesn't work great in like practical matters of getting up and getting to church on time. But <laughs> <laughs> he's just a tremendous, he, 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 William Bell's a tremendous, tremendous man of God. And uh, we appreciate him. We love him. Now, so we're going to have Steve Baisden now, who's going to be preaching uh, Sunday at the Bible class hour in Revelation chapter 20. He's done some good study, and I'm really looking forward to that because I like what you told me to begin with. That makes perfect sense. And uh, we're going to ask Steve to come and do Revelation chapter 14. Now, at 3 o'clock in the open forum, I had uh, set aside time for Steve to debate Rick Stafford. Rick's not yet here. We hope that he comes, okay? And uh, we're going to have an... Uh, a courteous Christian debate, no problem with Rick. We thought he was coming all the way over. He started liking everything that we had, and all of a sudden he's disagreeing a little bit. I tell you what, you come to the coming of the Lord, you get pressure like you've never got before. You be, they, they want you to pipe down, shut up, and don't say anything. Some of us don't like to pipe down and shut up, though. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so uh, Steve will be debating him as well. So I have all the confidence in the world. Steve Baisden is one of the best men in the brotherhood, even from the future's perspective, because he does more good work in the local congregation than anybody I know. Single-handedly now, and I'm just going to say that he, he, he's kept the work going. I know that Scott helped him in the initial stages, but Steve Bazin is just a ramrod. And uh, the great work at Ludding's, Ludington there is a result of Steve and his endurance to stay with the truth. So he's a people person. 
He loves the Lord. He loves the truth. He's done a great work. He's my friend. And uh, I would give up anything for him. I will spend and be spent for him. I said at the California lectures, I take a bullet. Brent said, what caliber? Big. Because I don't want to suffer for him, but I'll die for him. Okay? So, I, I mean, I'm not stupid. You know, yeah, go ahead. Take me out. You know, just don't make me suffer. But Steve Bazin's a great friend of mine. I love him. And he's going to uh, give us a lesson on Revelation chapter 14. And uh, Steve has a style about him that just gets to the heart of the matter. So we appreciate him so much. Steve, come and do your work on Revelation chapter 14. We're interested in what you have to say. Before I, before I begin, um, we've got 13 speakers. We've got a lot of things going on, people coming in from all over, over the country to make this happen. One person, I believe, needs to be at least, at least mentioned, and I have to tip my hat to Chad Keno. Amen. Amen. When I got here uh, yesterday, he was already here in the parking lot. He was setting up. I mean, he, he came from Wisconsin and brought all the equipment. He's here before anybody else. He's here after everyone else, and he's here while everybody else is here, working while everybody else is viewing. And uh, he does a tremendous work, and I just, I just, I just felt it necessary. I just wanted to say that before I began. Sure. So uh, you'll add now. We'll do, we'll do that again before the conference is over. Thank you, Chad. We yeah. love yeah. Chad. Amen. Amen. Yes. Amen. Yep. Appreciate uh, Chad and his wife and his family. They all work together. Believe me, it takes a whole unit to work harmoniously to make it all happen, and uh, they've got it together, and we certainly appreciate that. Now that I've made that, and I took a few moments to say, you can extend my time another 20 minutes, right? Uh, okay. <laughs> you got 45 minutes. <laughs> Revelation chapter 14. Uh, I, I found that Michael Miano was not coming uh, last night. I volunteered to fill in the gap, so to speak, and uh, I did not volunteer because I think I have all the answers on it, not because I think I'm a know-it-all, but I volunteered because I thought I just want to serve at a capacity to generate and provide what... I believe needs to be provided and the knowledge that we need to hold and understand that's consistent with the book of Revelation. And so last night I work midnight shift and last night while I'm working, I threw together a quick PowerPoint and I don't do a lot of PowerPoints. Normally my style is to get up and shoot from the hip. I don't even bring notes 99% of the time. I just go. Uh, but <laughs> I, I decided to put together a PowerPoint last night. It, all you guys were shaming me into it. So uh, Revelation chapter 14, verse 1. Let's get right into this. It's talking about this chapter, the 144,000, the harvest, the reaping, uh, just and unjust, uh, the resurrection of them, uh, being burnt with fire. Judgment in general is the idea. And it's talking about the idea of, I believe, from several different perspectives, from those coming out of Judaism and even those uh, perhaps of the Gentiles, and we're going to get into this and we're going to look at it. And what I would like to do is simply walk through it with you. I'm going to read Revelation chapter 14, verses 1 through 5, and then uh, I'll follow with the points that I made on the board there. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount of Sion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps, and they sang, as it were, a new song before the throne, and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song but the hundred and forty and four thousand which were redeemed from the earth. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb, whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God, and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne. I don't know about you, but ever since I was little, I would read the Bible. I grew up in a Christian home. Mommy and Daddy were members of the Lord's Church. We went to church every Sunday. And I would try to read my Bible and try to look at things and figure things out. And I would often turn to the book of Revelation. And I thought, boy... 144,000 virgins and that always struck me as being so odd. And I wondered how in the world 
You're going to find 144 virgins, and especially my adolescent years, get a little bit older, and you start wondering, man, what is going on here? Well, I think the Bible provides the answers, and we're going to take a look at this. And as we walk through it step by step, we have 144,000, which were the first fruits. In the book of James, James chapter 1, verse 1, we find that James is talking to the diaspora. Those Jewish people who had become Christians who were dispersed. They had been scattered all over the place. And James is writing to these Jewish converts into Christianity. He specifically says that's the, his audience in James chapter 1 verse 1. And then he refers to them as the first fruits in James chapter 1 verse, four, uh, verse number 18. So as we're going through this and we look at the 144,000, they were the first fruits. I believe this is the Jewish converts into Christianity before the coming of the Lord. That's what's taking place here. And they were the first fruits. And just like they would offer first fruits of uh, sacrifice unto God in their worship, they would plant the harvest. You would have the first of the first fruits, and then you'd have the first fruits offered. But the rest of the harvest would come very shortly after the first fruits. And it doesn't take a brain surgeon, it doesn't take Einstein to figure out when a crop starts coming in and you take the first fruits almost immediately within just a, a very short period of time, the rest of the harvest comes. You have to reap in this thrust in this sickle and reap the harvest. And that's what we're going to find here throughout the book of Revelation chapter 14. These were the Jewish Christians converted from Judaism. They sang a new song. As Jews, they would have been singing the song of Moses. Exodus 15 is one song of Moses. We find another one in Deuteronomy 32. But as Christians, they would no longer sing a song that was unscriptural. As Jews, they would be singing a song looking for redemption to come. Looking for a new kingdom to come. Looking for the end of their old one. If they kept singing that old song, it would be an error because the end did come. Their salvation did come. The new kingdom did come. The old one had stopped. So they can't sing an unscriptural song. And my brethren in the church of Christ recognize this truth. And there's many songs we have in our songbook in Ludington, Michigan right now that we cannot sing because they are unscriptural. These folk are no different. They cannot, listen, singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs is teaching an admonition to one another. It's a source of edification through the words of the song. They teach. And if you're teaching a false doctrine, you can't sing it. So these folks had to sing a new song. Why? The old one is now fulfilled. That's exactly why. They have a new song, and it's the song of the Lamb, the song of Christ. And it is those truths that would sustain forevermore, even for you and I and our psalm books today. And by the way, a little side note here, brethren. I would love to get together with the congregations that are represented here. We have probably eight or nine of them at least. Let's get us a psalm book that's scriptural, that doesn't talk about some future coming of the Lord, so we can open it up to any page and sing from our hearts and everybody follow along and truth be taught from those songs. We need to become like these people and get us some new songs. The old ones just don't work because they're unscriptural. So let's continue. No man can learn that new song except 144,000. I believe that's there because, listen, Gentiles never sang the song of Moses. They did not, they were not looking for the same things in the same ways coming about as the Jews were. So when the Bible says no man can learn that song, I think what the message is here, this is the only ones this pertains to. This learning of a new song pertains to the Jews. Other people don't pertain to them. The Jews had a new song. They were virgins. Folks, all that simply means is they weren't fornicators religiously. They didn't play hanky-panky and run all over the world like the denominational world does. I know everybody here has heard of the community church or the, we're, we're a non-denominational church. And what they mean by that is we're multi-denominational. What they're doing is they're sleeping around with every religion in the world. They're whoring it out, if you will. They're not clean. They're not chaste. They're not virgins. They are whores whoring around, but Jesus doesn't want anybody who's a fornicator, who's an adulterer, who's messing around with other religions. These people were 
wed to the Lord. They were committed to the Lord. They had not eyes for any other woman. Their woman was Christ, figuratively speaking. Their spouse was the Lord. And so they were virgins. And Paul said the same thing in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2. For I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin. Now listen. People in the church of Christ understand these concepts when they want to. But when they don't want to, they stop flat and they stop thinking and they start calling you names because they don't want to understand these things. I'll never forget several years ago, I got involved on Facebook with a conversation with about two dozen preachers. And they said, based in the resurrection, you're neither married nor given a marriage. Based in, are you married? And if you're married, you can't be in resurrection. And I immediately threw back Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, 29. For if you be in Christ, you're neither male nor female, bond nor free, for we were all uh, 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 one in Christ Jesus. So I asked them, are you a male? Because if you get the concept that in Christ is not a physical thing, it's a spiritual thing, and you've got to get that if you're a preacher in the church of Christ, if you're reading Galatians chapter 3, which, by the way, the previous verse to it says, as many of us as baptized into Christ and put on Christ, now we're all made one. There's neither male nor female there. I asked them, are you a male? And you know how they responded back to me? Basden now believes in women elders. <laughs> I'm not making, listen, I couldn't make that up. I couldn't do it if I, Basden now believes women should be preachers. That's how they think. And they probably think the same. They're like uh, the Muslims, right? Oh, I'm going to get me 72 virgins when I go to heaven. And they're thinking all carnally. And they're thinking all physically. And the Lord couldn't be talking about something further from that. The Lord's talking about our spiritual relationship. Because he's coming to save our souls. Not our toe jam and our fingernails. Rhonda asked me not to say boogers anymore. So he's not going to save that either. But <clears throat> they stood beside they, they, they stood before the throne of God in judgment. For we, that is Paul speaking to the Corinthians, must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20. They stood before the throne of judgment. I don't know if you caught that or not when we did our reading. Revelation 14, verse 5, right? They stood before the throne. Didn't Paul say that in 2 Corinthians chapter 10? Uh, chapter 5, verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Well, that's what they're doing. Does anybody in their right mind think the judgment seat of God, the throne of God in that judgment, is a different judgment seat than that of Jesus Christ? Certainly that's ridiculous. They are one. Jesus said so in John chapter 17. Whatsoever is mine is thine, and whatsoever is thine is mine. And we are one. And that we all may be one through the apostles' word, through their word. And so as we're going through Revelation chapter 14, the first five verses there, I can't hit on every nuance. To be honest, I don't understand every single nuance. But I'm going to pick out the major things that most people would pick out and say, hey, I'd like to understand this a little better if I can. Verses 6 and 7. An angel come down preaching to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. And as I read this, I was thinking of the Apostle Paul. You know, the Apostle Paul was a chosen vessel to bear Christ's name before the Gentiles. He is the one that took the gospel to every creature under heaven. He was the gospel. He was the preacher to the Gentiles like Peter was to the Jews. You can read about that in Galatians chapter 2. And I saw saying uh, uh, an angel come down preaching to every nation, kindred, and tongue of people. Revelation chapter 14, verse 6 says, let me read it to you. I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven. He's flying in the midst of heaven. I, 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 all right, let's keep reading. Having everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue of people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the foundations of waters. Paul taught that very message. And as I was looking at these things, I went to Romans chapter 11 last night. And if you read Romans chapter 11, it will knock your socks off. If you look at it from this perspective as Paul fulfilling and helping to fulfill in the role of the judgment coming forth. In fact, in Colossians chapter 1, Paul said, 
him, he, through his ministry, would all things be fulfilled. And that's what that reminded me of. And I, so I thought, well, is this referring to Paul? Perhaps it is. I'll leave that for you. I believe that that is a, uh, a possibility. But then again, I thought this. Even if it is Paul, it's the Lord. 2 Peter chapter 1 says, Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. It wasn't Paul's message anyway. It was God's message. Whatever Paul was preaching was the Lord's message. It, was, it all comes from the Lord. And so whether you believe in that or not, or whether you want to contemplate or not, it's still the truth of the message of the gospel going forth to all the world. In uh, Revelation chapter 14, verse 8, the Bible continues. And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city. Uh, because she made all nations drink of the wine or the wrath of her fornication. That's the only verse that talks about this second angel. You'll find three angels in Revelation chapter 14 coming. Uh, at, at this point of Revelation chapter 14, you're going to find some more where they're going to put in the sickle. But these three, at this particular time, only this one verse pertains to that one particular angel. And it says, it comes and pronounces Babylon has fallen, that great city... And that great city is Jerusalem. Now follow me. Listen carefully. I went through this with Drew Leonard in my second negative on the first night of our debate. I've gone through it with several others. She, that is Jerusalem, is Babylon. And she was made all nations to drink of her fornication. How do I know? Because in Revelation 17, verses 5 through 6, Babylon was the mother of all harlots. See? Drinking all nations of her fornication. She was the mother of all the fornicators, all the harlots. And she was responsible for all the righteous blood shed upon the earth. And Jesus said, stop. Jesus said, Jesus said, you know how many people I've talked to? They say Babylon's Rome. I said, doesn't it matter what Jesus says? And they look at me like a deer in the headlights as if I'm talking the second language and they can't understand me. Jesus said he was holding Jerusalem responsible for all the righteous blood shed upon the earth. From the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zacharias, son of Barachias, whom they slew between the temple and the altar. Verily, Jesus said it was going to come upon them in that generation and their house would be left to them desolate. For it cannot be that a prophet dies outside of Jerusalem. And here we find the blood of all the righteous. And Jesus said that would come by Jerusalem, which is Babylon. And you can read that in Revelation chapter 17, verses 5 and 6. So let's move on. Verses 9 through 11 of Revelation 14 says this. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead... Or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and with brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the lamb. This third angel warns to not worship the beast and his image, which I believe is the Caesar, which is reigning at that time. You'll find the sea beast convincing people to worship the land beast in Revelation chapter 13. And if they would fall down to Caesar's image and bow to his authority, ah, oh, now you're in trouble. Don't do this. These, this beast had a mark. Revelation chapter 9 verse 4 talks about this mark being a, a type of a seal. That's why I put a seal there. Something you could identify. And it would be in the foreheads and the hands of those that worshipped him. Just like the seal, the mark of the Christians. This mark or seal would be visible to those which could see. Now, I said that that way for a purpose, for a reason. If you're a Christian, I hope you're marked and I hope you're sealed and I hope people can see it. And if you're not a Christian, I hope they're marked. I hope they're sealed, so to speak, where that people can recognize them. You know, God doesn't have a rubber stamp with an ink pad up in heaven. And every time somebody becomes a Christian, he doesn't come down here and go boom, boom, bang on your forehead. Big old, big old 666 six, six on your forehead. Everybody can see six. Oh, here's that evil, wicked person based. And he fell from the truth when he was 19 years old. He became a wicked sinner. So God came down with his rubber stamp, stamped it in an ink patch, popped it on my head. Now, every time I walk around, I got 666 six, six on my forehead. Anybody believe that? That's the mark on the forehead. Not for one second. They didn't do it then either. Well, 
Well, what about on, on the hand? He puts the 666 on your hand then. Same kind of marking as a Christian. What does a Christian get? 777? So then God, you become a Christian. God comes down and puts 777 on your head, right? Oh, there's the mark. He's a Christian. No, folks. The idea, the, the idea of being marked in your head and in your hand is how you think and what you do. Your hand. Whatsoever you put your hand to do, do it mightily. You do it. If you're a Christian, be a Christian. You think it. You pray it. You show it. You act it. You live it, by golly. I don't want to use euphemisms. I apologize for that. Some may take offense. But if we're going to be Christians, let the world see it. Set a mark upon yourself. Please don't go to Staples and buy a 7-7 ink pad and go like this, okay? And put it on your hand. But people should know you're a Christian. Why? Every Sunday you go to church. Every time you go and have a meal in a restaurant, you bow and pray. You give thanks. When you talk to people, you mention Christ. You mention the church. You mention you're a Christian. They know, there's no doubt, you are marked with the seal of God Almighty. And it doesn't take an ink pad to do it. Didn't do it then. Doesn't do it now. God's wrath will be poured out without measure on these. And it would be with fire and brimstone. And the smoke of it would ascend eternally. That is something to contemplate. A lot of debate whether there's a hell. A lot of debate whether there's an eternal hell. A lot of debate whether some men will, will go there and just suffer a little bit for eternity. Or some men will suffer a whole lot for eternity. Or, or some receive few stripes and some many, you know, when I get my 10, I can get out. You know, and, or when I get my 55 or 60, <laughs> oh, well, then I can get out. And I know this. Whatever it is facing those who are unrighteous. They don't want to be faced with that, whatever that may be. And so I'm going to teach this is an eternal concept. And I'm going to get into that when we get to Revelation 20 tomorrow. So Revelation chapter 14, verses 12 and 13. Let me, let me read that, and then we'll, we'll keep continuing through our verse by verse here. Here's the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write. Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. And I got on the board here. The steadfastness of the faithful does pay off. I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Right, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. Henceforth from what? Henceforth from a judgment period. This is talking about eternally being sealed and marked with God throughout the rest of time. I heard a voice from heaven saying, right, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord. When? From henceforth, from now on. It's just as eternal as the verse before it that the smoke would ascend eternally. People eternally have the opportunity through the gospel of Jesus Christ to become Christians. In Isaiah chapter 9, Isaiah made the promise there will be no end to the increase of his government. Behold, the Lord of hosts will perform this. In Luke chapter 1, verses 31 through 33, the Bible talks there about Christ having an everlasting kingdom, and he would be the king of it forever. He doesn't give it back to God the Father. He doesn't relinquish his bride. He and God share that together in the unison that they have eternally, and that consummated at his coming in that time period 2,000 years ago. I broke this down because I wanted to do a side-by-side. I was reading Revelation 14 from my Bible and then giving some notes on, on PowerPoint. But I put two columns here. Let's read this left one first together. And I, I'll read, please. That's rhetorical. You folks just follow along. And I looked, behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle, and reap, for the time is come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. I don't know about you, but that's just some scary stuff. That stuff make your hair curl, 
make it stand up on the back of your neck if you're really reading this with an open heart, knowing that these things are true, knowing that God, the Lord of hosts, will perform this. And so it led me to my thoughts about Matthew chapter 9. Remember Jesus and his ministry? He saith unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Jesus was given to the Jews and talking about the harvest that would come at their end. How do you know that? Because of Matthew 13, the, he explains it. The enemy who sowed that bad seed uh, is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be in the end of this age, Jesus said. Stop. Audience relevance. 99.9% .9 of the folks here understand that. Jesus is talking before his coming here to those people looking forward to that coming at the end of their age. He said this when he was in the age of Judaism, in the age under the law of Moses. That age would end with the harvest. If the harvest hasn't come, Judaism and the Jews are still a valid religion of God. And now our futurist brethren, they want to talk about us having two religions going together. Man, do they ever got things. Do they have things messed up or what? They want to say we have two. They've got two because they don't have the harvest yet. And the Jews are still running around as God's elect. When all the while Christ gave his blood to remedy that problem. And they, they have eyes to see, but to see not. And they have ears to hear, but they just won't listen. And the earth, by the way, there, <laughs> this word earth is the Greek word gay. G-E. And that simply can reference, and often, most often does reference, a region or a country, ground or land, and sometimes it can mean world, according to Strong's. But this is talking about that country or region or land possessed by those Jews. That's what this is talking about. Let's move on to our next group of uh, scriptures. Revelation 14, 17 through 18. Another angel came out. Of the temple of heaven with a sharp sickle. And another came out from the altar which had power over fire and cried, Thrust the sickle, thrust in the sickle. It was thrust, and the clusters of the vine and the grapes were fully ripe. This is good fruit. God saw the fruit was ripe unto picking, and he took the fruit. He thrust in the sickle. That's a beautiful thing. That would be reference to his wheat, right? The next verse says, With the thrusting of this same sickle, it, came the vine, and it was thrust into the great winepress of God's wrath. This is the bad fruit. When you read it, the same sickle that reaped the good reaped the bad. It came from the same angel with the same sickle who's making the harvest. Matthew 3, now watch this carefully and listen. It, children, if you're listening on the internet, pay note, okay? And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. When? When was the tree, when, 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 when was this thing going to happen? And now, 2,000 years ago in the Jewish economy. Therefore, every tree which bringeth forth not good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. There's that fire. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I'm not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. I hope you're getting this. My brethren in the churches of Christ make the argument that the baptism of the Holy Ghost was only to the Jewish apostles. According to John 14, they make that argument. And it was only for that short period of time. But when you read Matthew 3, the same thing that would happen during the baptism of the Holy Ghost, they would get the baptism with the fire. But now they want to say, oh, this is the entire world burning up, and this is in our future. Oh, but this Holy Ghost baptism, though that's only for the Jews, and that's only for 2,000 years ago, and based on you're all messed up. I got news for you. Children, <laughs> that's terrible. That's Jesus. Jesus said, John speaking here in Matthew 3, said the axe was laid to the uh, roots of the tree already. He's going to cast them into fire. Mm. He was going to separate the wheat from the chaff. That's Revelation 14. In fact, that's all of Revelation when you're careful and you're reading it. The same people, 
the same people say that the baptism of the Holy Ghost is only for the Jews in the first century, deny the same baptism of fire, <laughs> and say that's the end of the time for everybody. When contextually, they can't do it. Not if they're going to be honest. Not if they're going to be honest. By the way, I want to be honest. Hoger said, every speaker here has said that. I think it's a key note to any good series of speeches made by Christians. You show me where I'm in error, I'm going to back up. It may take me a little bit of time. I may have to study through it. But I'm going to accept it if it's true and if it's real. You know, I didn't come to this thing just overnight on a, on, on a whim. Holger and I debated back and forth on the phone for a long time. I did a lot of personal heart searching. I did a lot of studying. I, I knew the consequences. I knew what was coming. But brethren, I had to make a stand. I had to make it. And I wasn't going to let the, my brethren who went before me, like William Bell and others, many others, take that hit on their own. And me stand back knowing it in the shadows. Oh, there's a principle there. A little bit off topic. But in Obadiah chapter 1, the Bible says, He that stood by and watched that happening on the other side is just as guilty as the ones doing it. God's people was being destroyed by the enemies and those who were friends of God's people just stood back and watched the enemy come in and do that terror and that harm to them. And God said, you're just as guilty as the ones that did it. Why? You stood by and let it happen. And I know there's a lot of people, oh, there's a lot of preachers in the church of Christ just standing by who agree with us, who know it, who see it, and they're just letting it happen. And they're just as guilty as the ones that condemn the truth. Make no mistake. All right, let's move on. Uh, <laughs> all right, Revelation chapter 14, verse 20. And the winepress was trodden without the city. And blood came out of the winepress, even unto the horse bridles, by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. Trodden outside the city. That's right. Why? Because there's a new city now. What is it? It's the church of Jesus Christ. It's the new Jerusalem. It's the heavenly Jerusalem. It's the heavenly kingdom. It's God's people. And in Revelation chapter 21, the Bible says nothing that defileth or is a liar or makes an abomination can enter into it. This took place without or outside God's holy city. They were cast out. They're never coming back. Trodden outside the city. Yeah, new Jerusalem. Nothing which makes an offense can enter into it. Revelation 21. The blood came out into the horse bridles. I had read, forgive me, I do not have the, the reference to this of the book by Josephus, but I have read by several commentators that Josephus said the blood was so thick in some places in Jerusalem by the, final, uh, by the time of its final destruction that it was to the bottom of the horse's bellies. And that would remind us of this. And it spread by the space of how long? 1,600 furlongs. Huh. You know that's 182 miles? Did you know that's the distance from the top of Jerusalem to the bottom of Jerusalem? Excuse me. From the top of Israel to the bottom of Israel? From Dan to Beersheba? Look at 1 Samuel 3.20. And all Israel from Dan even unto Beersheba. From all what? Israel. From the top to the bottom. What is it? 1,600 furlongs. You know, when Holger Neubauer made that argument with Dan, Daniel Denham, Howard Denham, Howard Denham laughed at Holger, made fun of him, because 1,600 furlongs, Holger says, from Dan to Beersheba. Well, excuse me, if this isn't talking about the end of Israel's God's chosen people, and all of it would end from Dan to Beersheba, exactly like the Bible says. And it's a distance of 182 miles, which is 1,600 furlongs. And if it doesn't mean that, please tell me what in the world it does. But I don't want to hear what you think. I don't want to hear what you feel. I don't want to hear what you assume. Give me book, chapter, and verse, or I will not accept it. We have book, chapter, and verse talking about Dan to Beersheba means all of Israel from the top to the bottom. That scriptural, brethren, that fits, that works. And that's what God said, and so be it. That's the end of Revelation 14. <laughs> we went through the 20 verses, but I want to say this, and I say this as humbly as I can. There's no way, there's no way an honest man can make these things in our future after taking the time to compare Scripture with Scripture. 1 Corinthians 2.13 tells us, 
comparing spiritual words, that's the implication there, with spiritual words. I'm going to compare what Isaiah said to what John said. I'm going to compare what Zechariah said to perhaps what Peter said. I'm going to compare Scripture with Scripture. And what God says, that's what makes it real. That's what makes it right. Not nobody, not anybody, excuse me, trying to be like a pope in the church brotherhood, the way it seems like Daniel Denham is trying to become. And I'm sorry I've mentioned his name several times, but he's one of the most vile, caustic men I've ever come across in my life. And at the same time, one of the most ignorant when it comes to things that he should be opening his heart to and learning. Similarity language, they throw that at us. And they say, Basin, Hoger, Bell, <laughs> Watson, what's wrong with you? Bishel, you guys? Claft, don't you guys know similarity of language? Doesn't mean they're identical. I agree with that. But brethren, when similar language has the same constituent elements of a one-time event like the second coming does, yes, sir, similar language is to be used because the second coming, it's only one. It's not a 1.85, Hogue. It's not a 1.2. You're right, brother. It's not a three. That's exactly right. You nail it. It's a second coming. It's for the judgment, the resurrection, for the new Jerusalem, for the new heaven, the new earth. When the old one, that old nation of Israel and God's old covenant people would end, you find those constituent elements. And if something has similar language, guess what? It's talking about the same thing. That's the end of my lesson. I had to say it. I had to get it in. So. <laughs> Shortly come to pass. There you go. Come quickly here. There you go. There you go. <laughs> you know, when we all came to the conclusion that Jesus returned in 70, I had no idea we were going to have so much fun with each other. <laughs> Wonderful job. Uh, thank you, Steve, for the exegesis, especially for Matthew chapter 9. And the uh, laborers sent for the harvest of the angel. That was great. Now, I hadn't seen that before. So that, I got that now in my Bible. That's a, that's, that's a great little gem. That's wonderful. So that's good exegesis. So thank you very much. And uh, so Steve calls yesterday and says, uh, you know, if you don't mind, he said, I'll go ahead and take Revelation chapter 14. And I said, well, if you want to, I said, now, you can do as good as any man that I know of just off the cuff, but I don't want to have one off the cuff. Because when Steve Bazin puts his mind to a subject, you're going to get some clarity. You're going to get something that you may not have seen before. And he works overnight. And uh, did you get any sleep last night? I got a few hours sleep. Yeah. A few hours sleep. He doesn't get much sleep. But uh, that was good thinking. Good exegesis. So I appreciate that. That was a very, very good work. And... Uh, you know, some of us get a little excited when we speak. Have you noticed that? No. Yeah. And, uh, and usually I'm the most excitable guy, but when Steve Bazin comes, I'm like second. So that's why I always invite him to every program that we have. <laughs> God bless you. What a great lesson. I love you, brother. You're a great man and uh, you're doing great work. And we're just very, very happy.